Good day to everyone. Thank you for your interest in today's SenStar e-seminar series. SenStar is the world leader in perimeter intrusion detection sensors and software. My name is Anthony Hackett, Director of Business Development for North America, and I'm honored to be your host today. I've been securing critical infrastructure since 2004. Joining me today is Stuart Duar, Product Manager at SenStar. Stuart has 15 years experience in the security industry, an extensive international business experience. He received his engineering degree from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And when Stuart isn't designing leading edge sensor technology, it's all about hockey, whether it's playing, watching, or talking about it. I'd like to also encourage everyone to visit our critical infrastructure use case area on SenStar.com. And this will provide access to different case studies and other valuable information. So let's discuss physical security solutions for electrical utilities. Take it away, Stuart. Thank you, Tony. And thank you all for joining today, uh, whether it's today, this evening, tonight, wherever you may be. So today we're going to go through a little bit about SenStar, just to let you know who it is uh, getting a briefing from. We're going to focus on the different security challenges that electrical utilities face. We're going to present some of the products uh, from SenStar that you address those effectively, talk about the system integration aspects, and then we will have time after uh, for questions and answer, and you can ask your questions on the way, the way through, actually, as well. So who is SenStar? Well, SenStar has been in business for over 45 years. We have intelligent video management. We got video analytics, access control, long track record in innovative perimeter intrusion detection systems. We have a comprehensive suite of proven integrated technologies that are employed around the world in over 85 countries. Some basic facts about SenStar, headquartered in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we got a video management division in uh, Waterloo, Ontario. Our manufacturing facilities in Ottawa. We have a fiber optic R&D center in Newtown, Pennsylvania. And most important to our customers is our sales and support network around the globe in all these locations, Canada, the US, Mexico, Brazil, UK, Germany, and, and more still listed there. And that enables us to effectively support these systems over their lifetime. And in particular, in the current state of affairs where international travel is limited, we have feet on the ground in many places on the world that can support installations today. Products deployed at tens of thousands of sites in over 100 countries. I was wrong with the 85, over 100. And a large uh, staff, uh, technical staff, 150 people. Very financially sound, so Stenstar will be here uh, in your for the duration. Industry experience, we have decades of industry experience and have been uh, honored to supply equipment and security solutions to some of the top names in the electrical uh, generation and transmission field. A uh, good concentration of North American names that you'll see there, but also uh, we have uh, experience in Europe and, and, and Asia and uh, the Middle East as well, securing electrical facilities. And one of our key facts uh, is that over half of the nuclear power plants around the globe have one or, the, one or more uh, SenStar perimeter intrusion detection systems protecting them. So what are the security challenges of the electrical utility field? So the first bullet is our first challenge or the first challenge of the, the physical security is to ensure the continuity supply of a critical resource that underpins modern society. And that sounds like the ultimate in hyperbole, but when you're talking about the electrical system it is actually in fact true. That's the, the level of criticality of that system. Um, our physical security is there to help ensure workplace safety and the safety of the general public. Uh, to contribute to conformance to government regulations for certain types of uh, facilities, uh, to help minimize direct losses through theft and vandalism, and the physical security system must not impede the day-to-day -day operation and access to the site that, that, the, that the systems require. And obviously the system must be cost-effective for sites with very differing security requirements you know, from large generating stations, particularly nuclear ones, for instance, transmission substations, distribution substations, which have the unique aspect of often being in a residential area, so that imposes some special requirements on, on, on them. And there's other sites with high, asset, high value assets like storage yards, uh, 
solar power plants with valuable solar panels, et cetera. These are the, the mix of sites that need to be protected. So what is this, what are some of the most common threats? The most common threat being copper theft. It usually results or often results in a service outage, which is damaging to the revenue of the utility and the reputation and puts uh, equipment relying on the electricity at risk. The theft can also endanger workers who may enter a site unaware that there's been a breach of security and damage done and come across loose you know, energized wires or equipment that's no longer safely grounded because the ground plane has been torn up by, by people looking for, for copper. Um, this theft is hazardous to the perpetrators, you know, leaving, leading to potential liability claims and just an outcome that, that no one wants to see. Uh, vandalism, more or less like theft, but without any economic you know, motivation. Uh, and then terrorism and the, the new threat of hacktivism. This is the low probability, but the very high impact event that regulators are most concerned about because they don't want uh, a, a critical transmission uh, link to go down that then creates a cascading series of failures and, and we have a grid failure like we had in 2003 in North America where 50 million people were out of power for up to two weeks. So that's the, uh, that's one, that's the critical thing that no one wants to see for sure. So why consider security technology? Can, can, can technology help? Of course it can. By themselves, you know, the fences, the walls, the security barriers that are put in place have, uh, they're effective for what they're designed for, but they only have a limited amount of deterrence and delay value. The threats are distributed over tens, hundreds of sites and, and they're ongoing and continuous. They, they never stop from one day to the next. There's always that, 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 that the threat is, is present. Uh, we all know that provisioning a guard force is, is generally considered cost prohibitive. And so a sensible combination of physical security technologies is really the only cost effective solution for providing physical security for, for the electrical systems. And it's important to recognize that, you know, the cost of one serious incident in terms of the damage, uh, the loss of service, the liability that, that can result, but can easily dwarf the cost of, of, uh, of the security implementation. So physical security is systematic approach. So due to the criticality of the grid, governments are involved with the physical security concerns. And in many cases, they've introduced regulations to ensure that physical security is being evaluated properly and addressed systematically. And in North America, the organization that is responsible for that is NERC, North American Electrical Re Reliability Corporation. So they've responded to this regulatory environment with a standard called SIP 14-2 uh, that covers physical security. And one of the elements that, that is introduced in this standard and, and the focus of the standard are these six key elements of a security strategy. Deter, detect, delay, assess, communicate, and respond. And you, you'll probably all have, many of you will have heard of different flavors of this. Sometimes there's, there's five elements or four or five, but this is the, this is the breakdown that, that the, the, the NERC have come, have come up with. So let's go through that and see how physical security technology can, can help with this process. So the first stage is to deter. You really would rather that nothing happened in the first place at all. So you're going to have a well-lit perimeter. You will have uh, obviously a physical barrier of some kind, a wall, a fence. There will be signage to say that you know this system is under, under surveillance and secure and, and dangerous. And you can take steps to what we call dynamically discourage potentially potential intrusions. Like for instance, if you have a video camera with uh, person, person tracking, as people approach the perimeter, you can do lightweight responses. Turn on your programmable light, bright up the site elimination, flash it, let people know that they're being under, under, under surveillance. Another thing that's possible is that a, a sensors can have pre-alarm levels that will not generate an alarm per se and, and cause the full response to happen, but, but can trigger 
a deterrent action. Again, a light, a sound, a PA warning coming on. And these are important steps that can actually deter an incident from happening in the first place. Detect. Obviously, electronic security is, uh, has tons of solutions and is deep in the technology of detection. So, if the threat is to, you know, going through the fence by cutting, climbing, lifting it, or, or ramming a car through it, um, there are many fence sensors on the market, including some from Sensstar. There are standalone sensors. Again, you know, Sensstar has those as well. You can do outdoor people tracking with analytics. Uh, with standard cameras or IR cameras, it's, we have industry can throw a lot of solutions at that that detection uh, problem. If it's a matter of the gate, uh, where there's limitations on how else you can secure that, we have a there's wireless gate sensors that you can use that that report um, their alarm state wirelessly without having any any wires encumbering the fence. If the concern is tunneling, we can use distributed acoustic sensing uh, around the perimeter to, de to, de to detect that. There are means to detect firearms and explosive devices being brought in into it into the site. And obviously, there's access control uh, for the gate, and there's means to deal with the scenarios of false credentials or misappropriative credentials. You can set up. Uh, use face recognition for the second factor in a two-factor authentication to to minimize that threat. Delay. Delay comes down heavily on the physical barrier that's in 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 place, um, and it generally allows guard forces to respond. In the case of facilities that are are remote and unmanned. The real point of the delay may simply be to de-energize that site uh, so that damage is minimized and uh, no one gets hurt. Um, one of the things that can be electronic things that can contribute to delay is programmable lighting that can bright up and flash and causing momentary confusion and disorientation uh, of the people attacking the site. And give that little bit of extra time to, to for the response forces to deal with the scenario. Assess. Here's where the central management, the head end system, as often call it, comes into play. You need integrated video management. Uh, you want to integrate that with your perimeter sensors. Uh, operators, whether they're local to the site or at a central uh, security operations center, they want good maps to tell them where things are happening. They want to know exactly on the perimeter. They want to have the right cameras pop up automatically in response to those sensors alarms. So we need a system that can link the cameras to the sensor alarms. We need tracking. We can introduce auto PTZ functions so that as the intruder moves around the site, the, the, the cameras automatically follow him, You know, keeping the operators informed uh, throughout the whole incident. Communicate, again, critical function of the, the head end system to communicate to the, to the security staff the, the, the alarm procedures. Who should be called? What police force for that region? Are there dangerous goods that need to be dealt, dealt with specifically? Uh, show a map, send an email, send an SMS, send a mobile alert to a, to a mobile app. Uh, send still images, recorded video, generate information in all directions to the, the to the coordinating staff and to the actual response force of, of the incident. Respond mainly a physical effort on the part of the the organization to either have on-site response, some centralized response force and or through the local law enforcement agencies that, that can come to the to the to the site where electronic security can help is in the, the post-incident analysis look at the video see the response times see where things happen and and learn from the response and, and move forward so that is the the main elements the main tenant of the the six elements of security physical security strategy as defined in this case by the by the North American NERC organization.
So what products can SenStar bring uh, to the fore to contribute to a solution? Uh, well, we have many. Uh, and this is only some of them, by the way, that I'll go through, the ones that are most particularly uh, adapt to the problem at hand. First one I'll talk about is our, our LM100 hybrid perimeter intrusion detection and intelligent lighting solution. So this constitutes a luminaire uh, with LED lighting, but also an accelerometer built in that does the detection function. So it detects and it has the lighting. So it, it's low voltage, so it's, rel it's, it's relatively economic to install around the perimeter. Uh, excellent for uh, upgrades to existing sites. The optical, the, the, the LED light and the optics in, in the luminaire provide a uniform light directly in the perimeter area. So it doesn't illuminate the whole neighbor, the neighbor, neighborhood and, and cause the neighbors to complain about the lights. It only illuminates where it's necessary. And the lighting is programmable. So you can the lights can go on at night, they can be on all the time, they can bright up on an alarm. So I've mentioned this a couple of times about an alarm response. So you can have a deterrence response where on a pre-alarm condition, the, the lights uh, bright up so that people know that, they've been, uh, that they're being monitored. Upon an actual alarm, then you can have the, the flashing and, and the dazzling effect uh, that, that takes place, that happens when that flashing takes place at night. Um, it's it's quite startling for people. So with this, you get some uh, the key benefits being an integrated deterrent and uh, lighting solution, uh, very low cost in terms of the operational. From a lighting perspective, it's you're saving up to 95% uh, of the lighting cost of alternative traditional lighting uh, solutions. And the luminaires actually report back to the to the to the processor or to the, the network main node through an encrypted, encrypted wireless mesh network. So there's no communication wiring uh, to install. You just install low voltage um, wiring, uh, very, very, very inexpensive, and you have your solution installed. FlexZone. FlexZone is a cable based sensor. You can see this is the sensor cable in the figure here. This is the processor that goes along with it. Each one of these processors can uh, energize and manage up to 60, 600 meters of sensor cable. And that sensor cable can be divided in up to 60 different reporting zones. So when the system reports to the, the security management system or the PSIM, it says, precisely where that intrusion is within one of its 60 zones that's defined in, in software. The system is very um, very optim very good for both small and large sites. It's it's um, it can be in installed in stages or, or sized out in stages. You buy as many of these processes as you need for the size of your site. For a small site, many small sites can be done with one such processor. And, and that's all there is to it. Larger sites obviously need a network of, of them, and we'll talk briefly later about how, how that networking scheme works. What are the benefits of this system? Relatively low cost, very simple to install. You're just installing sensor cable on the fence. Um, the system has built-in features to reduce the infrastructure footprint. Specifically, that same sensor cable is also your communications cable, and it's also bringing power to these distributed units. So there's very little that you need on the perimeter to, to facilitate the system. Has the software design zones. And finally, because this is a, what we call a ranging, or sometimes we call it a locating system, where it locates the disturbances to within plus or minus 10 feet, three meters, this greatly assists in reducing false alarms from, from wind and rain because it does not respond to distributed events that accumulate over the full length of a sensor. It only responds to concentrated events in one location, which would represent an intrusion event. 
Fiber Patrol FP1150, another cable-based sensor using a, a cable that's attached to the fence to create the sensor. Um, in this case, it's fiber optic, so you get the benefits of a fiber optic, meaning that in this case, you only need one processor centrally located and everything else outside is just fiber optic. So there's no risk of induced voltage you know, in, a, in an environment where there's high voltage transmission wires located. There's no grounding uh, concerns out, outdoors. There's nothing electrical outdoors whatsoever. Um, so this particular system, FP1150, can do up to 100 kilometers of coverage with one site. So whatever whatever size of site you can imagine, you can do it with with one of one of these units. And of course, because this fiber outside, it's completely immune to EMI, uh, completely immune to to lightning. And that same sensor cable that's on the fence that that carries the fibers uh, can be used to carry fibers for other purposes data communications for cameras, uh, general purpose communication, or communication to other sensor sensors. And we have a configuration of the system that provides cut immunity. So even if the cable gets cut, the full perimeter is still protected. So that's our Fire Patrol FP11 system. Fire Patrol FP400 has the benefits of fiber that were just discussed previously. This is optimized for smaller sites. Uh, this is a zone-based system, so this box knows where uh, an intrusion is down to the level of a zone, which would typically be um, up to 100 meters long, maximum 300 meters. This unit provides four zone, and again, because of the nature of it, this unit is typically installed indoors, so there's nothing out on the perimeter other than, other than your fiber. Xfield. Xfield is an interesting technology because it's it's been around for a while. Uh, the, the technology is um, called the electrostatic sensing, and it creates uh, it's a, an array of wires is used. There are there are wires that generate the electrostatic field and the wires that sense the electrostatic field. And when someone comes close to those wires, uh, they are detected. One of the key benefits of this system is that it provides a very narrow detection zone, approximately one meter or three feet from each side of that vertical array of wires. So it's well contained. So it can go down uh, narrow areas between a fence and a road or between the two fences. And it can be very tall. And that's kind of a unique aspect of this system in that you can create the array of wires um, we have solutions that go up to 24 feet or seven meters high. And this makes it very difficult to defeat. There's really no jumping over or driving a truck up beside this system and, and, and using the truck to, to jump over it. It's very tall and very effective. And for that reason, that's why it was selected and is a recommended sensor uh, per this guide the Nuclear Regulatory Commission Guide uh, 5.44 for Perimeter Intrusion Detection. This is one of the preferred and recommended systems. And this particular system, Xfield, is used all around the world, USA, Japan, UK, uh, Canada, Argentina, and, and many other countries. Switching gears a little bit into a, into to the, the video management and the overall security management aspects of the system. Uh, Sensar has the Symphony Common Operating Platform. So this provides video management, first of all, for Windows platform, web, mobile platform, and, and our thin client solution. It also provides integrated alarm management, uh, on-screen controls for cameras, can provide two-way audio, uh, maps for perimeter intrusion, handles access control and can trigger IO devices, uh, monitor and trigger IO devices on the perimeter. It has built-in video analytics and in fact the analytics is, is almost uh, the core underpinnings of the system. Uh, the, intel the searching is done very intelligently using pre-computed metadata, not trying to do the raw 
searching computations on the fly. It uses the, the, the metadata that's been done in advance. It's scalable and has high performance architecture. And we'll talk about that just a touch more in the, the next slide here. Symphony can run on off the shelf Windows hardware, supports thousands of network devices, um, a long, long list of cameras provided. We support the OnVIF uh, profiles S and G, and specifically designed to have a low server footprint. So, however many cameras you have, a Symphony solution will typically require a lower server footprint slash stack than, than other competitive systems. It has embedded failover, so there's no need for any kind of clustering or, or never fail solution in the hardware. The Symphony software supports that. And the licensing is done, as a, is done on a per camera basis. So, and it's very easy to move the, the, the licenses from different two different cameras as, as you require them, as you add them or subtract them. And here's the breakdown of the overall system. Obviously, we the long list of cameras supported, access control is supported. We support integration to Sensor PIDs and others. We can activate to current devices, and we have these different platforms for the system. Windows, mobile, our own thin client to provide a very cost-effective way of bringing uh, video and alarm management to a to a to a desktop that might be just at a, at a guard post, and you don't want to get involved in the whole Windows rollout for that. And we have it on the web as well. There's different ways to get Symphony. We talked uh, just momentarily ago about it running on a standard Windows hardware, but you can get it. We can provide it embedded and packaged. And the first manner here would be in our in our um, E-series e servers here. This is perfect for, basically perfect for scenarios where the requirement to have a video server wasn't foreseen in the first place. So you're putting it on a on a shelf, you're putting it in a cabinet, you're sticking it to a wall, and, and this is rugged, it, it has extended temperature range, it doesn't need, uh, doesn't have, it's fanless, so it, it's quiet. So that's one way to get it, and then and for larger deployments, we have the R series. These are Dell enterprise grade <clears throat> servers. We have mini tower, one U, two U formats, depending on the size of the deployment required. And in this series, licenses are bundled with it. So you're buying a hardware software bundle that's, that's pre-integrated and ready to go. So we support uh, three year warranties on this. This solution of the, the bundling dramatically simplifies ordering and, and support and we can do uh, you'll get Dell on-site support for these solutions switch of gears integration so if you have sensors you will need to integrate them to the security management system which can be done at many different levels and many different uh, degrees of complexity. And here's the simplest of all cases. This would be, be a small, maybe applicable to a small distribution substation in a neighborhood, small site. One flex zone, one FP400, or an array of LM100 luminaires. And in the simplest of all cases, the relays that are built into the processors can simply trigger an alarm panel that's at the site for that's maybe been collecting door door locks or, <clears throat> or door contacts for since forever. We can add the security and integrate that the same way. So very simple. Now that simple solution may not work for larger sites where you have multiple sensors. In that case, you definitely want to integrate and <clears throat> connect to the sensors through through um, a field network of some sort typically we would we have our own <clears throat> network we call silver network optimally works over uh, fiber optic in 
electrical utility environments to minimize any grounding or concerns with the conductive wiring. So we bring that back to an interface that would be in the, in the control room or the equipment shack. And then we can bring that to our network manager software, which is kind of connector gateway software that allows us to take our information and display that to, um, to wherever, our own systems, third-party systems. And in the next slide, just go into a little bit deeper into that about the network manager software. First of all, this gateway software works with all sensor sensors and interface has standardized interface that we can provide an SDK for free of charge and uh, with, with support. Or if there, if integration is not done or there's no appetite to do one, we have standardized means to communicate our sensor information to third parties, uh, one of them being simple AXI test, test text messages, sorry, uh, that are configurable. So for every alarm, every diagnostic condition that can happen in the equipment, uh, we can send a customized text message for that over TCP IP or serial. Or we can fall back to good old fashioned relays and, and close a relay. Um, again, for any condition, any alarm or diagnostic condition that can happen, we can activate an individual relay for that. So we have lots of ways of communicating to third parties. And of course, the network manager is fully integrated with our own software, the Symphony software, our StarNet 2 uh, security management system, and our AIM simple guard check security management system. These are some of the third-party integrations that have been done. This includes ones that have been done from our network manager to third-party systems and from third-party systems to our Symphony common operating platform. So it's quite a long list. A lot has been done and there's constantly new integrations being developed over as time goes on. So looking to the future, uh, sticking with integration, but this is a different kind of integration, where we talk about integrating the signals from different sensors, so it's sometimes called sensor fusion. So by we have the goal of integrating our signals from our fence sensors or, or buried sensors with the information from our analytics to come up with uh, the ultimum and optimum in perimeter detection that best discriminates real intrusions from nuisance sources. And this would involve pattern recognition, artificial intelligence, and use a multi-sensory approach so that all the sensors that are on the perimeter are being monitored in a holistic fashion and not just using the, not, not just one sensor on independently deciding whether there's an alarm or not. The information from all sensors, cameras, fence sensors, buried sensors, whatever there would be fused together to determine the alarm condition. The sensor is in a unique position to do that as we have the the sensors, we have the video, we have the video analytics, we have all that to bring that to the party and that is what we are, are working on. So that's really the, the presentation. Um, the key points being that technology, security technology has a lot to bring to the party to support the key physical security elements of deter, detect, delay, assess, communicate and respond. We have we can contribute to every one of those the elements. Multiple technologies can be used together to improve capabilities. And integrated solutions improve event assessment and response capabilities. And the availability of these integrations is critical to whether a solution is effective or, or not. And since there's product range and relevant industry experience, uh, make us a uniquely capable partner in securing electrical infrastructure. And we hope to continue 
doing the job that we've been doing for decades in that field. So thank you very much. Excellent job, Stuart. So we have uh, a number of questions from um, a lot of the attendees. I know we were planning for about 40 minutes here. So would you be all right if I um, throw some really good questions at you? Yeah, please. Yeah. Would you be able to go back to the LM100? There's a, a few questions regarding um, how far the light is cast um, and, and where that lighting is actually um, being broadcast to. Could you just address that and then we'll move on to the next question? Yeah, the swath of light is, uh, I would say it's typically maybe about 10 feet, you know, three meters wide. That is the effective lit, maybe a bit, actually a bit more, sorry, more probably more like 12 or 13 feet, you know, four meters where the lighting is, uh, you know, effective for its intended purpose. Okay, let's switch gears over to Xfield. Um, what the exact question is, what is the probability of detection and nuisance alarm rates for X field? The probability of detection, you know, when, you know, the usual caveats apply, you know, properly installed, properly calibrated, it uh, meets or exceeds the, the, the typical perimeter intrusion level of at least 95%. Could be higher in a, in, a, in a good installation, but that's the typical. That is the specification uh, that we, that we for our system, and actually for for most of our systems. In fact, the actual regulation, strangely enough, uh, this uh, the um, NRC guide that I mentioned there requires that the system have a probability of detection of ninety percent, which to most people like is like shockingly low, but, and uh, I think maybe it, it does seem low, but I guess it's that that limit presumes that this is one element of a layered approach. But mm -hmm. you know, 95% is the is the typical nuisance alarm rate. Very difficult to quantify. Uh, again, very dependent on the on the, the quality of the installation. The best way to answer That's it is that, is that it, it, this is the effective and primary perimeter intrusion detection system for at least half of the nuclear plants in the, in the United States, and it's effective. So um, the nuisance alarm rate is, is manageable. It's not zero, but it's manageable. Okay, uh, and there's no stun capability on this type of product, correct? That is correct, and um, no, that's yeah. a good question because it's not. Uh, you might feel the the voltage, you know, slightly, but it's not at all uh, dangerous. Um, but to someone coming upon it, it looks dangerous, to be honest, with those big insulators. So there is a visual deterrent uh, effect to it. All right, let's switch gears over to flex zone. Uh, the question is, can we effectively use the flex zone for electrical substations? Uh, they're concerned about the potential problems of EMI. You wouldn't mind addressing EMI and flex zone. Yeah, no, that is, that's uh, excellent, even a fantastic question, because the world basically splits two ways. One has concerns about, you know, induced voltages on the wires and, you know, the, the grounding the other half of the electric utility world feels that those are manageable. You properly ground, you know, where necessary and call it a day. And so we have many, many, <clears throat> many utilities um, using the flex zone for their perimeter intrusion detection. Actually, probably it's the most deployed or it's one of the more commonly used ones for sure. So again, you know, I've, personally had discussions with um, technical security staff at um, electric utilities that, you know, have nightmare scenarios about that, that, that cable, but a lot of people just feel that it's, that it's uh, completely technically manageable and, and use the system. Going back up to uh, Xfield again, 
what, we have some people asking about the distance in between posts. Um, what, what's the typical space there? So we recommend six meters, so about 20 feet between the the supporting the the posts that support the insulators. We call those in the in our terminology in the X field. That's called an interim post because it's not a there's tensioning posts and there's interim posts. So you need a tensioning post every approximately 50 meters, like 180 feet roughly. But the interim posts that just have the insulators without the, the huge bracket, that's, a, that's actually a tensioning post that you see in the picture there because it's holding mm -hmm. tension on the wires. Um, the interim posts, actually, or the next post in the background, you can see it doesn't have that the same heavy-duty uh, clamp and support arrangements. That's what you need every 20 feet. And you need one of these tensioning posts every approximately 170, 180 feet. Yeah. And it looks like um, X Field's the winner today. Uh, can you discuss or bring up some of the environmental considerations? It needs some clearance from you know fences and, and metal objects, uh, at least a meter on each side. Um, one of the things that's not obvious from the picture, but there's a ground wire that runs on the surface at the base of the posts, and that uh, must be present to to minimize the influence of um, of electrical storms or or ground ground currents. The only time that Xfield has we've had a challenge in delivering a manageable the only environment that we've had a challenge in delivering a manageable uh, effectivity in terms of nuisance alarm was a case where the um, the, the cooling towers were positioned, it was nuclear plant, and the nuclear the cooling towers were positioned that there was a constant non-stop thick cloud going through the, the X field wires. And that that scenario, like this was like a like a Scottish, you know, English fog you could cut with a knife kind of scenario. That system did not had had struggles in that environment but other than that um north america europe japan you know environment it's been com com compatible with the insulation environments all right let's um go over to the fiber patrol product can you talk about um i know what they're getting at they want to talk about the immune cut immune system can you um maybe talk a little bit about what happens if someone were to uh, cut the fiber um, and how how that alarm system would still be working. So the picture, the lower picture, um, sketches that out, the cut immune. And the key, the cut immune is based on two key properties of, of this particular system. One, it has two, it activates two sensing fibers. So it's got two channels. Two, the technology that underpins the fiber patrol uh, is a reflectometry based approach. So um, it always works up to the point of, of a cut. So if, I think you can see my mouse, so if the fiber were to be cut here, uh, the full perimeter would still be protected by one fiber or the other because they, they, they go and counter. Uh, Counter rotational directions, one clockwise, one counterclockwise, and that's mm -hmm. the the main principle. So A, two channels, B, uh, working up to the point of a cut in the fiber, and C, when you install it, you have to obviously install it in a, in this counter directional way, otherwise um, it won't work. So, but that's easily done. Okay. And all these yeah. fibers, by the way, are in the same cable. These are just uh, two fibers in a standard telecommunications grade. Uh, fiber optic cable. Very good. Couple symphony questions here that I can take care of. Uh, uh, keyboards, microphones, uh, anything that's USB can be plugged into symphony. Um, and as far as the analytics are concerned, um, 
generally speaking, uh, we don't need a lot of pixels on target to um, detect uh, whether it's a vehicle or a person. Uh, we generally need 15 or so pixels to classify it, though. And, um, of course, every every setup is going to be unique and different. Uh, and that's why the product is available for free to download, uh, to test for yourself. And um, at any point in time, we can engage an engineer to help uh, make some tweaks uh, to the configuration. Uh, but you'll find it that it is um, relatively easy to set up and configure all on its own. Um, and that's uh, a very big differentiator between our analytics and, and other analytics that are out in the marketplace. Um, another, uh, another point um, on the L, I'm sorry, on the uh, A10D uh, Stuart is we do have some customers where uh, they're using third party contract um, security folks, and it's part of their um, audit, um, they were able to deploy uh, this uh, unit. This is deployed, whether it's a Symphony product or it can be anybody's VMS, really. Uh, all this is doing is looking for OnViv protocols on your network, and, and what would it allow you to do is provide video feeds to um, employees or contract workers who need to be able to observe video but not necessarily have a connection to your network. Um, so this is a very uh, safe and secure way to provide video uh, to individuals, whether they be in a guard shack or front desk or uh, for whatever purpose um, where folks would be um, able to look at the, uh, the video feeds um, and not have access to the system or to the network. Uh, it's simply just displaying live video uh, on a monitor. Very low cost and uh, secure way to deliver video feed to a monitor. Well, with that, Stuart, um, we've taken up 50 minutes of, of everyone's time, and we've got uh, a number of uh, follow-up questions here that we're, we're not going to be able to get to. We'll have to um, – we'll promise to uh, reach out to you individually, and um, we do appreciate the – uh, interest in the uh, large number of um, people here this morning and um, uh, we're here to answer questions we're here to um, help you to make uh, sound decisions in protecting your your substations and uh, at any point in time feel free to reach out to us sunstar.com and also try to visit the case studies area where you'll see a lot of different resources for electrical utility substations. Well, thank you very much, Stuart, for your time this morning, and thank everyone for participating. Have a great day. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone.